Um, hi, my name is Jane Prosakova, and this is a talk on good code. Thank you for coming. If you're here for this talk, if you're here for a different talk, I'm sorry. This is, a, this is my talk about good code. <laughs> um, I'm a software consultant, which means I, run, I write code for other companies, not the one I work for. And I get to see a lot of different code bases. A lot more, and they change uh, more often than uh, the number of code bases I saw when I was uh, working for a production uh, product company. How many do I have? Anyone who is not a developer here? Okay, so everyone is going to go and write code. If not this week, then on Monday, right? Okay, great. <laughs> there is a lot of code following uh, the slide, but. Uh, first, why do we care about good code? Apparently you all do because you are here. I care about good code because my job is to deal with code that is not good. <laughs> As a consultant, I'm usually invited in when there is a mess. So we end up trying to figure out what is it our clients hire us for? What is good code? We ask people what good code is and this is more more or less the list than we get. We start with it works, right? We, we want code that works. Bug free, uh, maybe, somewhat. Uh, there is usually, uh, someone always brings up fast. That's a whole different conversation. We always want to talk about good design. I'm not going to teach design here. And then people will say that code that's tested and that can be changed without introducing errors. That's what we end up doing most of the time when we have something that works and you want something else to happen on the same code base. And then the code that is testable is a whole different story that gets more complicated. When I come in as a new person on a code base, my answer to what is good code is this, readable. Because consultants are expensive, they show up for a short time, they're supposed to make a quick impact and not just consultants, right? When you're coming in at a, as a guru developer, you're expected to make a lot of progress quickly. So readable makes a huge difference at how fast you can get productive. So usability, we've been talking about usability for a very long time. Abelson and Sussman are uh, computer scientists from a long time ago, authors of this second edition structure of interpretation of computer programs. This is not a new idea. Programs are for people to read and only incidentally for machines to exe ex execute. When I took a compiler class back way back in college, the common sentiment that was offered is make a common case fast and the rare case possible. This is how systems are built. This is how programs are done. But it also applies to developer experience. Code is read by a lot of people. And it's interpreted by usually the same compiler in the same exact way. Compiler can do its job rep <laughs> repeatedly pretty much at the same level of well. But different people will struggle reading the code over and over again because, well, we are in a different mood, we come with different experience, the lightning can be, can be different. And it's important that we read the code in the same way. There's huge business value in how readable the code is. Besides bringing consultants that are expensive, there is more typical business case. If a code base doesn't do what the business wants it to do, there's a huge value loss there. Clients are not happy, the work is not happening. Uh, a lot of successful products are worked on by many different teams. Anyone expects to retire on the product you are working on this week? Probably not, I see some smiles. Yeah, uh, we want to move on. We want to move to the next project or the next product. And we hope that the stuff we are working on today is not going to die with us. We hope that it will live on and will keep producing value and hopefully the business will want to develop it further or at least move to a new technology. And how fast we can bring uh, changes to the code base affects the value of the product we are building. So we are talking about technical quality, not just for the sake of craftsmanship, but for maintainability. We want the code 
to be readable to the people who show up. They might be fresh developers out of code. They might be someone very, very senior who is coming in from a different uh, company. Mutability, being able to introduce changes, being able to introduce changes without changing, bringing unexpected changes. And testability, uh, knowing what will happen, not just in with single requirements defined user story, but what happens if you wander off a happy path? How is it going to break? Is it going to break at all? Is it going to steer the user in the right direction? Is it going to recover? Is it going to be in one big mess? So fast, fast is a whole different case. Do we want the code to be fast? I tend to work in a business domain and fast isn't an issue. What happened? Uh, code should be fast to create. Businesses want their products to work now. If you tell a manager you can have it in two months or you can have it next week, 100% of people I have personally encountered it said next week and maybe this Wednesday. <laughs> uh, there is a very cheap way to get fast, get more or faster hardware. It's a lot cheaper when hire people. It's a lot easier to when hiring better people. And correctness trumps speed every time. There might be a product out there that you can leave with bugs as long as it's fast. I haven't worked on it. Maybe game development? I don't know. I haven't been on game development. And yes, I know exceptions exist. I, I've met with people and I've seen code bases where being fast is very important. Being correct is still more important, but being fast is extremely important. But these tend to be exceptions. Most of the code bases I encounter, and I hope you have similar experience, fast is not that important. So this is Bukati. Uh, this is a Bukati car. It's, a, it's the stri fastest street le legal car out on the market. Top speed, 280 miles per hour. It's expensive. Uh, the first year it was out on the market, they sold 250 units, 250 cars. In the next two years, I think they sold another 250. And do you recognize this car? This is a Corolla. This is the most popular car out there. You can't hear me? Yeah, let's just put a crackling on there. Okay, all right, can you hear me? Okay, great, I'll, I'll try this. <laughs> Um, so, it doesn't run that fast, it's not that expensive, it's the most profitable car in the history of the market. It, it sold so many units, Toyota makes the most money on this particular car. The models change, the car is out for many, many years. As developers, some of us probably work on Bucatis, but the majority of us, and if we change jobs, like most of us change jobs, most of our time is spent working on Corollas. So let's build better Corollas. <laughs> there is more money in that, even though Bucatis are more fun, right? So I'll be talking about three different things. Making code visible for people who haven't uh, written it. Showing logic, showing how you're thinking, and uh, looking at ways to limit complexity. So let's get to it. This is not easy, there's going to be a lot of code, so some pictures to rest. Uh, this is a per personal story. Uh, when I joined my uh, first real uh, team, I was just after college, we were writing fairly complicated code, SSL implementation, math, uh, handshakes, encryption. Uh, there was this saying that people tossed around. It was hard to write, therefore it, it should be hard to read. And being fresh out of college, brand new developer, working with very smart folks around me, I kind of at face value. So it was hard to write, so this code is really hard to read and it'll take me a week to figure it out and maybe some more time to get it right, to make, get the changes to it right. Uh, fast forward, I'm no longer that first developer, five minutes out of college. It's 
I don't go by the saying anymore. It is my responsibility to write code so, to make it as readable as possible to someone who is coming in onto my team with whatever experience we are bringing. And I work with a lot of students. Uh, starting junior year, we've, we've had some people from high school. We are trying to write code and we run it by them to make sure it's readable by them. It's not going to be easy regardless, but we'll try. it's up to us to make it as easy as possible. Yes, it was hard to write. Ma let's make it a little bit harder to write so it's easier to, to read. Okay. So the first thing that we encounter on client code bases, and I don't know if you've had this experience, there is no white space. White space is, for some reason, rare and scarce. And you don't notice how important it is until you've seen lack of it. Space in an indent, and the worst part is horizontal scroll. Our IDs are very nice. You can have any size window you want, except you're going to have to scroll. So how about this? This exists. Well, this is obviously toy code, because I can't show you production code that I deal with. But this style of the text wall exists, and there is a horizontal sc scroll about two screens wide here. Uh, if you're writing this, please stop. <laughs> if you're reading this, add white space. <laughs> like this. Simple enough, right? We don't spend enough time doing this. But even simpler than that, you shouldn't be doing it by hand. Your IntelliJ, your Visual Studio have templates that can format this. You don't need to have discussions about this. It's auto-formatted. It's decided once, and it happens automatically. It's amazing how much code that exists out there, and not just exists and runs, but being, is being actively worked on. That looks like this. So this is better, but this is not good yet. So here we are adding more white space. Not just indent, but you know, just put some space in between. This is still better. You can focus on the one piece at a time. You don't have to, like, look, read the entire thing here. I need. Uh, and finally, the word we like to introduce to code is narrative. The code is telling you a story. There is logic. There is something that's happening. And it should fit an ID window. You should see the entirety of it in front of you without switching multiple windows without scrolling anywhere. You might not be able to get out of vertical scroll, uh, but it's much better than horizontal. We are built to handle vertical scroll uh, evolutionary. People are told that's, that goes much better with our uh, physiology. And finally, move distractions away from direct view. And that's technical details. We are all going to be spending time figuring out technical details. Algorithm implementations. Uh, error handling, login, whatever cross-cutting concerns you're going to have. But we'll get back to this later. But in order for your narrative to fit in the ID window, a lot of the time you need to push everything that doesn't belong to that narrative out of view into a library. Sometimes a library you can borrow, sometimes a library you're going to have to build, depending on your domain. So comments. This is a question that I tend to ask in user groups and you know teams. Yes or no? No. Good. Yeah, because that, that, that's great to hear now. Uh, students out of the class come out straight up and say, yes, our professors require comments. Well, professors require comments on code that is designed to show understanding. It's not designed to work. It's not designed to last. As professionals, we are in a different paradigm. The code is designed to work, and it's designed to last through generations. So I suggest no code, uh, no comments. Comments are hard to write, and we are taught to express our thoughts in code, but we are not necessarily getting an education in English or whatever language you happen to write comments in before you start coding. First, you shouldn't need any comments. 
second comments tend to be wrong. And uh, we spend a lot of time reading comments and then being stuck with comments. When comments contradict the code or when comments are irrelevant to code. And finally, it's taken space, right? So you are adding vertical scroll. Sometimes comments will be paragraphs, paragraph after paragraph of prose. Uh, if they felt they needed to write this, maybe the code should have been better. So uh, this is an exam example of a comment I found that's marginally helpful. This is real code. This is from Mozilla and rendering ed engine. This is open source code, which is why I can show you, show it, it. The code is pretty scary. It's, it's all technical details. Uh, the comment makes it maybe more clear, but only by a tiny little bit. And hopefully it's hidden far enough away from the bigger logic so that it deals with one narrow issue, but still, this is at the point where you still, you're thinking if you need this comment or not. Everything that's less obvious, uh, this is what's more typical. This shouldn't exist at all. This has no right to exist. Here's another po popular example. Do not explain logic in comments. Logic will change, comments will not. Uh, and this is an opinion what's pretty aggressive in this person's view. I'm not even sure. And this is scary. If it's that simple, yes, you know, delete the comment, move on, but sometimes there will be a block of code inside that still returns false, no matter what happens. Okay, this is very common. We find it a lot. You have a bug documentation in the code. This tends to travel because the code that has it gets cut and pasted a lot. So you'll find this kind of notes in a code that has nothing to do with this particular issue. More than, more than that, it, well, the date here is 2003. Your bug tracking system might not go back there that much. But you still have uh, comments in the code that point to the issue that no longer exists. So presumably it was fixed or forgotten or the feature got deleted. Okay, so don't do that. Let's talk about logic. Uh, again, back to the idea that code has a narrative. Make logic visible. Side effects are scary because something changes and something else is going to react and there is no way to tell by looking at this particular code screen. Naming is the biggest problem in computer science with a possible exception of uh, adding extra references. And show decisions. Show technical decisions that you made when writing this code. It might have been obvious to you why you decided to go this way, but it's not obvious to a person reading that particular piece of code years from now, or maybe weeks from now. So let's look at details. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Well, I beg to differ, but a lot of fools do. There, there is a, a lot of code where the argument is, oh, but it works. Don't touch it. Um, and good programmers write code that humans can understand by power. It's, it's important and humans can be different and we still want a lot of humans to understand it. So what does this do? a tiny bit of code and you all experience developers and someone who really cares about your craft otherwise you wouldn't be here no how about this this is bowling the difference is variable names <laughs> uh, you can't make this up this is really hard right and this is really easy you need to know a very vague idea you need to have a very vague idea about volume scoring to guess that this is what it is. And 
This is incredibly powerful. This is even more powerful when you are getting up to speed on, on a code base because that gives you, uh, having good names gives you a way to talk to users, to, to clients, to people who uh, request different features, to your product owner. It's important to speak the same language. The code has to speak the same language as the product and as what's been requested, what should be happening. So you could figure out the ball in the example if you spent enough time playing with that, but why would we want to? <laughs> I, it could be fun, but it's not really productive work. So back to Toyota's away from Bucatis. <laughs> So logic can be obscured, and it's, it can be obscured by stuff that's misleading. It also can be obscured by stuff that's clever. Uh, for a while, clever was a good word. We kind of moved away from the connotation that clever is good. Clever became bad. <laughs> uh, we don't want jumps. We don't want hidden decision points. If we can get away from side effects, we should. This is an interview moment. What does this method do? It calculates temperature. But the problem is, oops, sorry. It calculates uh, temperature, but what does it return? You don't know. If you have code like this, don't touch it and don't write anymore. Uh, you have to pick your priorities. I'm not suggesting you go and fix everything that looks like this, but if this code is life, as in it's been worked on, you don't want it to exist. This is a recipe for breaking stuff. To make logic visible, one of the important points that we want to make is you want to write at cohesive level of abstraction. Keep the scope level. Reading the code should, to make reading the code easier, you should be able to read line by line without changing the level, how you're thinking about the program. I'm going to show an example. You want to have items that are similar in scope next to each other and items that are different in scope in different places. So here is a method. We are looking for tickets, and then we are looking for uh, cheapest tickets. There is some sort in the middle that creates, uh, creates an array, sorts it, and returns a response, uh, return from the method. There is different level of abstractions here. There is a method up there that has uh, a fairly defined function, find me tickets of particular kind. And there is a method here that also finds tickets based on particular objective. But in the middle, we have technical details that implement sort. It happened to be bubble sort, but it can be anything. It can be a real sort, and then it'll take a couple of pages. Besides the point that you shouldn't be re-implementing sort, keep this at the dealing with tickets method level and put your implementation separately. That way, if you want to fix how implementation is done, you can focus on this particular implementation. But if you're looking for the narrative of what happens, what this pick best ticket method returns, you can focus on that and find the proper, uh, find the proper uh, approach at a higher level. It's I actually find it a hard argument to make because people like technical details. People like implementing algorithms when they can. And it's once you start doing this, you notice that you have a gazillion sort functions in different places or uh, a dozens of uh, methods that calculate time in a different way based on uh, your product. Because it's more fun to write it than to find something that already exists. 
but if you start creating a separate method, it, it becomes easier to find them and to put them together and to avoid duplication. So this is not just this is not just easier to read, it leads to reducing it leads to reducing the size of your code base, reducing duplication of the code base, and this is more testable because you can test these pieces separately. So what abstraction means is uh, a confusing point. Abstraction is not about being vague, it's, it's about being precise, just thinking at a, at a certain scope level. This is, a, this is another piece of sample code from some tutorial. They are teaching people to write code like this, and they do, and we do. This is full of technical details. This is a screen full. But actually what happens is you create a session by starting a transaction, then you do some query, and then you close. Separate your uh, logic from technical details of how your interface changes. That might actually free you to change the underlying library later. It may not, because the library may dictate how these things run. But this definitely leads to easier reading and better understanding of what's happening. Okay. And um, complexity. Who writes simple code? Okay, ju just a few. I'm willing to admit it. <laughs> and the rest of you write really hard code? They all write at the level to which we get used to, right? The very few of us struggle day to day with every line we write. We get used to, we, get, we learn to the point where we are comfortable at the level of complexity we are. And it becomes harder to explain it to someone who doesn't, haven't had this experience. Why what we do is easy, not really that hard most of the time. And that really hampers learning and that leads to poor readability and that leads to poor transition code from team to team. That leads to a lot of bugs. So cleverness is the enemy. The very simple thing, if you can limit nesting, please do. If then is a scary enough animal to not create multiple levels of that. Unfortunately, that happens a lot. Top-down control flow, how easy is that? It's, there are go-tos, but there are also jumps. There are different philosophies about is it okay to exit from the middle of a section uh, of a method. Maybe, it depends on your team understanding. If all of your code base exits at the bottom of a method and someone decides to start writing something on the side that jumps out from four different points, that might create a problem because people will not read all the way down. At the same time, if you do jump as soon as you're done, maybe it's okay. Your team is expecting this and that's fine. Uh, and do one thing at a time, which happens to be an object-oriented principle, basic principle, do one thing at a time. The code that we write gets uh, more complex with every year, simply because of the nature of what we do. Once it's written, it's there. There is no need to rewrite it or there shouldn't be any need to rewrite it. So the stuff that people worked on 10 years ago was simpler than what we do today. The stuff that all these smart people that I'm quoting here worked on was so much simpler than what we do today, be simply because we worked 50 years ago. So we figured all this stuff uh, because it was complex for that time. We are working on more complex things, we just know how to handle complexity better. This is not a real quote. This is a great saying that's attributed to Albert Einstein, but uh, no one actually heard it. We've heard of people who said he said that. But it makes a lot of sense. Make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. It's a great quote, but it's terrible advice. How do you know if you've made it as simple as possible? <laughs> okay, what can be simpler than magic values? You're just hard coding what's fair. And this is not a new idea. This has existed since a very long time ago. JPEG begins with particular hard-coded values. GIFs be uh, 
begin with hard coded values, Java class files, zip files, you name it, everything is differentiated by begin and sequence. This is a really bad idea. First, we had all those security bugs that you can engineer to uh, in get the system to interpret the code coming in differently. And this leads to cut and paste, hugely. Uh, I've worked on code bases that tried to read different kinds of streams. The pro this was rampant. Everything had been cut and pasted and we didn't know what was broken and what wasn't until somebody started complaining from a different format. So rather than using uh, magic values, use named constants. Simple as that. It, it, it's not the most sophisticated advice you're going to hear at this conference. Uh, just, no, this is too far. So having a named constant makes a huge difference when you're inviting someone else to participate in your code base. Uh, whether it's a new person, whether it's someone coming from a different team, or you're passing off your work to a team in India, in Russia, in Thailand, in rural America. I don't know, I come from rural America. <laughs> so that's it. Control flow. Uh, I, I worked with architects who loved those diagrams. And I think the main, the main reason they exist is to show how important the person, how smart and important the person who created them is. They don't communicate anything. The point of code and the point of architecture is to communicate knowledge about what we are building. This doesn't. This communicates confusion. So simplify the control flow, including in this diagram. There is no direction of control flow. Even though this is not code, you can express it in code or you can read it. You can try to read it and get confused. So, Object-oriented paradigm gives us a lot of principles to write better code. The stuff we inherited with um, the stuff we inherited from before object-oriented is uh, the stuff that we want to get away from. Go-tos are from the 80s and before. Nested ifs still exist. They, they're still there. If we can get rid of them, we should. Guard statements is a very simple pattern that is not used enough. Everyone knows what guard statements are? Do I have guard statements? Yes, I do. Uh, check something and then get out. Uh, and you don't get, the first one is a guard statement. If it doesn't fit the constraints of this method, get out, you don't need to read anymore. Or, okay. So, and top-down flow, but I, I fall on the side of get out, don't finish the method, it's okay to have multiple return points. So, again, this is real. This is hard to read. The code on the next page does exactly the same thing. There are a couple of methods pulled out, and fewer lines, more white space, and a lot less headache. But going from here to there requires tests. And this is hard to test. So in addition to everything else to not being readable, it's, it's also error prone and it's not testable. This is more testable because work happens in separate, in separate methods and you can test three uh, separate ifs without else. It, it's fairly easy, it's a fairly small number. You may be able to break it down some more. Okay, to you on this. And then the most complicated question we have with Teams, uh, depending on which platform you come from, there is, there is complicated stuff. Languages come with some complicated stuff there. For C-sharp, it's yield return. Who uses that? Who knows what it is and uses that? Okay, lots of hands. Okay, this is a .NET conference. A lot of people do simple C-sharp and don't know what yield return is. Uh, we try not to teach it. In fact, we try to avoid, to recommend not using it if 
clients are hiring developers at a lower salary range, and it's visible. In-out parameters are really complicated. This is how people make mistakes. This is in-out parameters are side effects, basically. Don't use them. It, it's a lot easier to write to jam everything into a single function by using in-out parameters than to break down the code. It seems easier, but it's harder to deal with, it's harder to test. Reflection, people in Java love reflection. It, it makes us feel clever. <laughs> Again, besides being slow and error prone, don't do it because the person who is coming after you might not have the same master's or PhD as you have. Don't burden the client with a product that's not maintainable. Threads, if I see new thread in, in the code base, I know it's bad, right? It's either bad or old. There are better ways to manage threads and a lot of the time we are, there is no reason to deal with multi-threading at a developer level. There are containers for that. Most of the stuff I deal with is business, not really faster code, but should be running on a container if it already doesn't. Some people do, do threads even in a container where it's expressly prohibited. So this is the theory how all these nice things are supposed to work. The picture is supposed to illustrate multi-threading. All the dogs lined up doing their thing simultaneously, perfectly lined. And what happens really? Not quite so nice. And you can debug multi-threading, even if you wanted to. Uh, I was in, in an earlier talk today, and they asked, how many times does it have to work correctly to know that it's right? The answer to that, there is, there is no answer. It can run correctly as long as you know, but it may still break in the future. You can reason about it, hopefully, but you may be wrong too. There is no way to test for this. Okay, and how am I doing on time? Hmm? Well, okay, great, thank you. And the final is architecture. Uh, a conversation we have all the time. Can I put this extra parameters if we get this extra thing? If the clients want to, us to go in this direction, can I put this extra flexibility in? People want to do this, sometimes we ask, sometimes we don't ask. Sometimes we find this extra fl flexibility built in. I'm going to build this visitor pattern just in, ch in case we might want to do this. Or let's use the message bus, we don't really have the case for it just yet, but hopefully we will. Well, you're putting a big investment. Not one-time investment, but something you're going to carry forward in, in terms of more complexity, more code, more work to maintain, more bugs to deal with, because extra lines of code equal more possibility for bugs, based on a guess. As far as I can tell, developers are pretty bad about guessing which way clients will want to go, <laughs> or users will want to go. Uh, most of the extra complexity that I've seen built for the future didn't pan out and I'm talking 90 plus percent. Yes, we are going to need more flexibility, but not in the way we predicted. So don't build it just yet. At the same time, there are ex exceptions to this case. A colleague with which we discussed this talk at the time of its creation, when, but we talked about good code, has worked on a project that uh, changed three different databases by ripping out the direct connection to the database layer but never developed its own interface layer. So they changed databases three times, they've re rewritten their entire access three times. We, I guess after the first or maybe second time, it made sense to create their own database access layer so that they did, wouldn't have to do the entirety of it. Uh, next, we changed database, but of course we said we are not going to need it, this is not going to happen, we'll stick with this SQL Server or what have you. So. Rely on your experience. Your mileage will vary. If you want something, if you want extra flexibility, you may not be right, but uh, 
by the time you're changing it second or third time, you probably do want to put in extra work. It's a balancing act. Extra complexity is there sometimes for a reason, sometimes not. And with that thought, this is it. Thank you. <laughs>